Hi everyone, in today's video I'm going to be giving you a complete breakdown of how I created my latest animation called God's Window. All right, so there we go. That is the animation. Now, I wanted to create an endless looping animation that's quite calming and soothing to the soul. So I'm going to be breaking down everything that you see within this animation from the environments to the foliage to the animals and the clouds and the fog and the surface of the water moving, the butterfly, the dog's tail wagging. Uh, there's a lot to cover within this video. Even I'm even going to be doing a little bit of audio design in Premiere Pro just to explain how that was all brought together. So if you want to see how animations like this are created, then without further ado, let's get started. Alright, so let's go ahead and break the scene down. Now, I'm going to do my best to try and explain everything, but remember this is a breakdown, not a step-by-step -step tutorial. I just want to give you some insight into the tools I'm using. So let me just hide this fog plane and let me snap out of my camera so you can see what's happening in the 3D viewport. So you can see over here, since our camera is just looking forward, it really doesn't matter what's happening on you know the far right, right hand side and the left hand side. But let's just talk immediately about the landscapes you see in the distance over here. So these landscapes, it's just the basic landscapes that are built into Cinema 4D. So I just hold on my left mouse button, select landscape, and you can create these quick landscapes that you can place in your scenes. Now I literally just scaled it out like that, like that and I made it taller. So this worked well for this scene. Right, just something that I could have in the background as well. And remember with this built-in tool, it's got a whole lot of settings over here. Like if you wanted to make the tops flat, you could uh, reduce the plateau level. So it's a pretty cool tool. It's quite basic, but it works for what it's intended to do. If you guys are trying to create really detailed landscapes, I highly recommend World Creator. And I've got an entire series for that as a playlist on my channel. But this worked pretty well for my scene. So there's a material on these landscapes as well. You'll see if I zoom in over here. So don't pay attention to the foliage right now. I'll be explaining how that was created. But if I zoom in over here, I've got this grass material. And the easiest way to find the materials is to use Quixel Bridge or Quixel Mega Scans. Uh, so if you guys are not familiar with Quixel Mega Scans, this is probably the best resource ever for finding materials or 3D scanned assets. It's absolutely incredible. And you can see over here, I just typed in search grass. And the cool thing about Quixel Bridge is that you can link this with Cinema 4D. And you can see if I select this material, I can actually export this directly over to Cinema 4D and it will apply it onto those materials. So when you have Quixel Bridge set up, you can see over here in my extensions, I have this Mega Scans plugin. I can even select to apply material to selection. So whatever object I have selected in my scene, and as soon as I click on export, It'll basically export it over to Cinema 4D and automatically apply it onto uh, the geometry. Now, if you guys are using Quixel Bridge, I also highly recommend uh, that you go to Edit Settings, you Edit Render Settings, make sure you've got Octane Render Renderers enabled and Material Override selected as well, so that it can send your materials over correctly. And you'll see, even if I go to my Export Settings, over here, my export target is Cinema 4D. So you can choose whatever program you're using. It will download the plugin for you. And you'll be able to send these materials straight over to Cinema 4D. So absolutely incredible resources, Quixel Bridge. I used it for all of these environmental materials that you see within the scene. Okay, so let's talk about all of this foliage over here. So all of the wild grass that you see on this distance, distant landscape, and even all of the grass within this grass tunnel was created with an absolutely incredible plugin called Forester. So you can see in my extensions over here, I have Forester. You can create trees, you can create flowers. They've just got this large library of awesome foliage. So the company is 3D Quakers, and the plugin is called Forester. So it's for Cinema 4D. I'm currently using it with Cinema 4D R23. It's really, really good, and I highly recommend using this. And the great part is you can even animate the foliage. So you notice in my animation that the grass was blowing in the wind as well. So the plugin allows you to do that. Right, so just to demonstrate this quickly, let me just snap out of the camera. And I'm going to create a plane. Right, and I'll show you how I actually scatter the foliage on this plane as well. So let me just create a plane. All right, where are you? There we go. Just scale this up. Okay, so I've got a plane. 
over here. And now if I go to the plugin, you can see over here if I go to, let's say I want Multiflora. So I'll go to the Multiflora, I can go to the library and you can see they have this large li library of all of these different plants. So I'm just, I'm just going to choose Wild Long Grass for now. And let me just see where it created this. Right, so here is our Wild Long Grass. I'll just bring this a little bit closer to the camera. Right, so there we go, we got some grass. So there's a whole lot of settings you can adjust. Now I'm not going to do a complete tutorial on Forrester. If you want to watch a really in-depth tutorial, just YouTube David Aru. He's got this environmental series on using Forrester. It's absolutely fantastic. I just want to show you how the plugin works. So you can create uh, grass like this. And then the, the, the way that I scattered this grass on these objects, like on the landscape, was to use an Octane Scatter. So if I go to Objects, Octane Scatter, and then I make the wild grass a child of the Octane Scatter, then I select Octane Scatter and for my surface I want this plane. So I just drag and drop plane into surface and I want to change this from vertex to surface. Now you can see it scatters all of this grass on this plane. So that's exactly how I did it on the landscape and exactly how I did it in the grass tunnel as well. You can see I can increase the count and it just automatically scatters that grass for me effortlessly. So it's really really good. And what's really cool about this as well is that you can use vertex maps to actually choose like where you want the grass to be visible and where it should be hidden. So let's say I select my plane and I'm just going to increase my segments to 100 by 100. Right, I'm going to press C to make this editable. Go to my polygon selection and I'm just going to grab this tool. Now let's say I want there to be a path over here. So I don't want any plants to be visible on this area. I can do that. Go to select invert then go to select and set vertex weight on a hundred percent click on ok now i've created this path over here and you'll see if i go to my octane scatter we have a vertex map section so i can just drag and drop this vertex map from the plane into vertex map and now i've created this path now if i double click on my vertex map and i hold on control i can continue adding to the vertex map as well so i can just continue creating more of a path so just a really easy way to do that. And if I left click now, I'll be bringing back the foliage. So if I want grass to be visible here, yeah, I can do that. So really cool how you can use vertex maps in conjunction with Forrester and the Octane Scatter. So that's the method that I used for all of the foliage that you see in the scene. And then on the foliage itself, like on the wild grass patch, you can see there's an option called Hyperwind. And if you turn that on, the grass is going to be animated. So if I click on play, this grass is, will actually start swaying and blowing in the wind just using this hyper wind feature. Now you can obviously, I can go to Control c Control v duplicate this, make another grass patch a child of the octane scatter and bring in a different plant. So let's say uh, this Im Imperata and you can see I can start using that and you'd probably want to use a where is it? A random effector. And then on the octane scatter, go to effectors, put this in random, just so it randomly scatters the foliage in your scene. So just showing you quickly how this was done. Uh, in case you're wondering how I actually generated all of the foliage that you see in the scene. Uh, but definitely go and check out David Aru's tutorial on this if you want to learn how to use a forester correctly. Of course, it's a lot more in-depth. So, so since we're still talking about Forrester, you'll notice with this giraffe as well that I've actually applied some of the Forrester to the giraffe. Let me just pause. Actually, wait, let me zoom in a little bit. You can see there's some Forrester that's on the giraffe as well. And it's in this region. You can see from, even from this view right now, uh, the reason why I applied this on here is because I wanted, wanted this to look more believable as if this giraffe has been... You know, it's really been living in this environment because the environment has now become a part of the giraffe. We, we even got like these little plants growing on its legs. Or this could be insects, right? If you look at, if you seen this from a distance, uh, it could even be some insects. So just like I showed you how it, how you apply that onto a plane, you can do it with anything. You can apply Forrester onto literally anything. So it's over here, grass, giraffe. And then on my distribution, I decided to use a 2D V gradient. And by clamping it like this, it doesn't put any grass towards the top of the giraffe, but keeps it towards the bottom. 
right, and then I just played with this min value as well uh, which also controls the amount of grass that ends up generating on your giraffe and I think I, I had to make the size of this flora quite small uh, let me just see you can see it's an octane scatter here yeah this was on 0 0.001 I had to make it really small uh, because even if I go to 0 0.03 you can see it makes this grass a lot larger now maybe that's cool maybe that's something you would want uh, but yeah i thought i would just show you that i also added some forester onto the giraffe itself just to add a little bit more detail all right so let's talk about this grass tunnel now i already showed you that this is forester foliage that's been scattered on geometry but the the actual tunnel itself i know some of you are probably thinking oh but that's simple that's just a cylinder but it's actually not a cylinder this is a plane right this is a plane with a bend modifier on it so i wanted to do this because i had this idea of also you know bending reality almost like the effect you see in inception so you can see if i select this bend this entire plane ends up bending and creating a cylinder but all of that foliage that's attached to it uh, remains attached onto the plane so it's a pretty cool effect that you can that you can create so to create this uh, all you need is a plane you want to increase the segment so there's more geometry for the bend modifier to work with you want to uh, create a bend modifier and make it a child of the plane and then over here i'm just going to move my bend modifier to the left and i'm going to hold down shift and rotate this in increments and then rotate it on the green axis by 90 degrees as well so you can see this arrow is pointing up and just move this below uh, the plane then I want to go to my bend modifier I want to put my alignment on X plus and my mode on unlimited so now when I increase the strength you can see exactly what's happening over here now it's just a matter of me let me just select the bend and just moving this you know till the that section where it closes is at the top so now I've got this inception bending plane like that. I can go all the way to 360 and you can animate it. So you just click on that. So, you know, on frame zero, it's on zero percent. Then on frame 50, it's on 360 or when it will start closing. So right over there, the 225 and that's animated. So that's exactly how I created that tunnel. And I was able to place the geometry, uh, sorry, the foliage on there using Forrester. And something else I wanted to mention regarding our grass tunnel over here. You'll see if I go to the Octane Scatter, I'm actually using a noise shade on here. So I just clamped up the rel relative scale and the global scale. And it actually has a really interesting effect with the way this has been laid out with the grass. Let me just send this over to Octane again. Uh, so you can play around with noise. This will also determine how the grass is scattered. Like let's say let's move this here and let me just hide this other grass tunnel two because I'm just focusing on this one. So it has a really interesting effect just by playing around with the noise. Let me maybe also zoom out a little bit so we can see what it's doing inside of the tunnel. So it's almost creating like this like a st stair stepping effect. With the grass like you can see some areas has the grass shorter while the other areas has the grass a lot longer and that's in relation to this noise shader that's been generated you'll see if i change this to something else like let me just get rid of it entirely you'll see what the grass looks like now this is what it looks like without a noise shader but with the noise shader on here it can really affect the way the grass is scattered you can see just by applying a regular noise shader it makes it look a lot more randomized so if we put electric on here, you can see we get some more randomization with the way the grass is being laid out within the tunnel. So let's talk about the lighting. So this is really simple. I'm just using an octane daylight. That's all that I'm using in my scene. There's no additional lights. So it's just under objects. And then you can create a lights and octane daylight. And then on the octane daylight itself, if I go over here to the settings, I've just increased some of the power and the sun intensity as well. And I brought my sun size to one. Well, I think by default it is on one. Uh, by controlling the sun size, whether you make this bigger or smaller, the lower the value, the harder or sharper the shadows are going to be. And if you increase the sun size, you'll get, sh uh, you'll get softer shadows in your scene. So you'll see if I select my octane daylight and I rotate this, 
I now have control over the time of day, <laughs> which still blows my mind. The first time I did this in Octane, I was like, wow, I can actually control the sun. Uh, so yeah, that's all that's light in my scene. And I just positioned it so that, you know, the sun is just peeking in. You can see, I just put it just above the tunnel, but I've still got all of this light uh, seeping in to my grass tunnel over here, creating all of these really nice highlights uh, on the scene. And I think it looks really nice. All right, so now I want to show you a super awesome technique for generating, you know, like distant fog without using VDB. So I consider this to be a lazy method, but it's a great way to do art direction as well. So if I bring back the water in my scene over here, and I will be explaining how that was created as well. Let's bring back the water. So you see how the image looks without a distant fog plane. Now in reality, you know, because there's obviously fog in the atmosphere, uh, whatever's further in the distance is always going to be a bit lighter than what's in the foreground. And how I created that was to create a fog plane. So if I enable this, there's literally a plane over here that's casting this turquoise hue on any distant objects. So it acts as a, almost like a fog volume. And if I just go out of the camera, you can see that this is just a giant plane that's placed on here. And essentially, if I go to the material over here, if I open this up, it's just a diffuse with the opacity reduced. <laughs> so that's all it is. This is a really nifty a trick that I use for creating distant fog. I just place a plane over there and reduce the opacity. So you can even, and uh, oh yeah, the, another cool thing is the light in the scene, because we are reducing the opacity, is going to pass through this plane and still be able to light you know, additional objects within your scene. So you can notice that even though there's a giant plane in the background, I'm still getting lighting information from my octane daylight because I reduce the opacity. You can see if I clamp this all the way up, it's affecting the lighting in the scene. This is getting a lot darker right now. You can see if I clamp that all the way up, I'm almost creating like a silhouette. So using planes as a way to create distant fog is fantastic. And the fact that Octane Daylight can still pass through these planes is an absolute game changer. So there we go. And if you want to, you can even add a noise in here. So if you feel like just a standard flat, flat plane is way too boring, add in a noise. And now, uh, let me just increase this. And now with a noise, uh, it's almost creating like, it'll almost look like foam grain in the distance. And that can be controlled over here, maybe with a low clip. Uh, so if I actually zoom in a little bit more on our plane, that distance fog is not going to be completely clean. It will actually, I know it's a little bit hard to see now because the screen size is so small. Uh, but yeah, it almost, it looks like noise, uh, but it can also look like film grain. And that's just by applying a noise. But super handy technique. You want to create distant fog, use a plane and just reduce the opacity. So I use the same method for, you know, these distant clouds. So if I hide my fog plane, we've also got a cloud plane. All right, so the cloud plane is here in the back and this is an image of some clouds. Now, and if you're using images of clouds, you maybe want to try and match your octane daylight lighting to maybe be similar to what you see in the image. Or you could just use it as an element of, you know, just generating clouds in the sky so that your sky doesn't look completely blank. So there we go. And if I go to the material, uh, you can see I've got the image in the diffuse. I just found any image of some clouds. This, this is from Photobash. And in the opacity, that's being controlled over here. So again, because we use an opacity, light will still pass through. And I can play around with the gamma over here, maybe increase the power if I wanted this to be a little bit more visible. And I can maybe go to the node editor, go to my color correction on diffuse and play around with the hue. So we can change the color of those clouds as well. But it's just a cool way to add something into the sky. And because it's opacity, light is still going to pass through, which is super, super awesome. So I can always, let me see. Yeah, there we go. You see, just play around with the gamma and choose how much of those clouds or images I still want to be visible. Uh, but it's just one method you can use for adding clouds in your scene is to always use this opacity. All right. You could even have some overhanging clouds over here. So 
if you wanted to, you could create another plane. Let's say duplicate this and make this one facing down or maybe at an angle so that we can still see it in the camera. Let me snap to my camera. Let me see where this is. So this is like bringing clouds a little bit closer to the camera. You can see them over here. So you can even control like the distance. So it's a lazy method of generating clouds, you know, instead of using VDBs, I think it's a cool alternative. I can also maybe go to the node editor and I can use a octane noise. Oh. Let's move it there and plug this into the opacity. And you can see there it starts generating some clouds just from this image. Maybe play around with the gamma a bit. Reduce that. Now it's almost like creating a very foggy or overcast sky. And that's just being done with the noise. If I remember, I think I saw this technique being done a long time ago by RET. Uh, but it still works really, really well. So overcast sky, there's some clouds over there. Uh, just a lazy method for doing this. Uh, if it's something you want to do. But I used it primarily uh, just to have some clouds in the distance. Now, obviously that's gone because I removed my material. There we go. I'll just drag and drop that one back on. But yeah, there we go. Then you can have some clouds in your scene. Okay, so let's talk about the water. Right, so I'm going to snap out of my camera over here. And you'll notice that our water is just a plane. Right, if I go over here, it's a plane with a displacer. So there's a lot of different ways you can create uh, water, but I wanted to use a displacer because if you look at our animation, right, pay attention to this water that, or this, this dry grass or these reeds in the water. The grass is actually submerging the, the, uh, the sorry, the water is submerging the grass underneath it, uh, which I think adds a lot more believability. And if this was just a simple plane, you know, with no displacement on it, then you wouldn't get that effect. So this just adds a little bit more believability. It's very subtle, but it works really well. And you can see we've got this calm surface of the water that's just continually flowing towards uh, our view. So how I did this is very simple. And I'll show you, I'll just go to File, New Project. And what you want to do here is, I'll just make this a bit smaller. So I'm going to create a plane, scale this out. Then you want to create a displacer make it a child of the plane. So now with the plane over here, the more segments you add, the more detail you're going to have in your water. So in this case, I'm just going to put this on 200 by 200. Let's bring in an octane daylight. Okay, I'll just bring this octane daylight into the scene. And obviously wherever the light in this place is also going to play an important role on how this looks. So now with the displacer, you want to add a shader. This is how this works. You want to add a noise shader on here. And you can choose whatever you want. So in my case, I actually used electric. And let me just go back to the displacer, go to my object, decrease some of the strength. All right, and then you also, the material plays a very important role. So the material on here, you want something that's glossy. Uh, usually with no roughness, you actually can add maybe just a tad bit of roughness. Make this really dark for the surface of the water. So now you can already see what's happening over here. And just increase the index as well. And then the magic again is with opacity. Opacity is such an incredibly useful tool. So you reduce the opacity so that whatever's underneath the surface of the water, you'll be able to see. So if you had a sphere, whatever that's underneath, see I can still see the sphere underneath the surface of the water, or maybe it's floating on top. And I'm just adding some more segments on there because that was looking absolutely disgusting. <laughs> it's such a low poly uh, resolution. Anyway, there we go. So that's how you create water. It's very simple. And then you go to the displacer and to animate it, go to shading, go to the noise and just animate the global scale. So you'll see over here, if I animate my global scale, the surface of the water is animated. Right, you can see it moving. So essentially on frame zero, maybe global scale 136. And then if I wanted to move really slowly, 
or I can maybe go to like 500 frames and then on frame 500 it will move to 164 and there you can see so if I click on play now I've got this surface of the water that's moving and it's displacing the geometry so like I said when there's reeds or whatever that's in the water it's going to f the water is going to flow over that geometry but this is a very very easy way to create water for your scenes that's also animated so just a calm surface of the water now remember try other noise noises as well maybe you want to use just the regular noise you can use that and again like I said if you add more segments so if I go to 500 by 500 it's going to add more detail uh, to the noise but in this case it doesn't work that well just with the regular noise I know you see a massive difference a difference especially with the electric you can see if I bring that to 200 by 200 see how that looks by 500 by 500 adds more detail so there we go that's how you create water for your scenes and that's how I animated it as well so I hope that helps okay so now it's time to start talking about the characters in the scene right so let's start off with our four-legged buddy over there so the French Bulldog this is actually a Daz asset so on Daz the product is called Daz a dog right and then I, I got this breed over here which adds to the Daz a dog which is a French Bulldog so if I go to my Daz you'll see that we even under your library you'll, you'll have an anime, uh, animals folder and then you can see I've got Daz a dog and then if I go to breeds our French Bulldog is right over here so I can just double click on that and it's going to load in our little buddy right and if I click on my French Bulldog I can choose to change the color of its coat as well so I went with this fawn and there we go so there's our little buddy and you can see he's completely rigged I can pose him however I want him to be and in this case uh, in the animation it's quite subtle but his tail is wagging so I could essentially just select this part of the dog's tail and then in my timeline on frame 0 I would rotate it let's see in this direction then go to frame 5 and rotate it the other way then frame 10 rotate it this way and then to get this to get this to loop correctly oops I want to make sure that my end frame is in the exact same position as my starting frame so in this case I'll just put this on 10 and there we go and that's how I created a looping wagging tail so really awesome asset I'll probably use this again in the future just the fact that I've got whoa okay so now it's starting to dance <laughs> that's not what I wanted to do but yeah maybe in the future again I'll use this dog it's really cool that it's completely animated like everything even the ears if I go to parameters there's so much stuff over here that I can do uh, with this rigged French Bulldog right so that was it then when it was animated I just saved this out as an FBX and I brought it over to Cinema 4D alright so the human character is actually a 3D scan now if you're wondering where you can find 3D scans on my channel I actually covered a video on this so awesome websites to find 3D scan objects paid and free you can go ahead and check out the different websites but that is a 3D scanned character right so now I also want to talk about how I actually added some very subtle animation to this 3D character you can see that there's an internal rig and it's probably the most lazy and basic rig ever but it worked you'll see if I click on play if we pay attention to her hands it's like she's moving her body very slowly just to add a little bit more motion to the scene so how did I create this rig and this works well with 3D scanned characters so I'll actually grab her press ctrl C go to file new and ctrl V to paste now I also want to make sure I'm just deleting this weight tag and deleting all of these joints this will show you how this is done from scratch so here's my character and I will go to character go to join tool now you want to hold on control and left click to place your first joint and keep holding on control to place more joints so I would literally place joints like this and while I still have this tool selected I want to make sure that my rig is contained within the 3d character so something like this so now you get in an extremely <laughs> basic uh, rigging tutorial right but this was extremely lazy but it did work right work smart not hard right <laughs> anyway there we go so I would place a rig inside the character 
and once it's contained inside hold on shift select everything go to character go to bind so this binds the rig to the character and it generates this weight tag so now if I select a joint let's say this one go to rotate and you'll see if I rotate this she starts moving so that's exactly what I did and I would just animate that very slightly just to add a little bit of motion now obviously you can see if we go to the front and yeah that that that's nightmare fuel <laughs> but yeah basic rigging uh, tutorial that's how I added a little bit of motion to this 3d character all right so you'll notice that there's a butterfly in the scene as well if we actually look at the video you know it's always these small details I love adding them into my creations you can see over here it's just flapping its wings on her shoulder and this is an asset that I've created Right, it's on my Gumroad page. It's completely for free. It's 10 animated butterflies. There's a whole lot of uh, animations, idle animations, slow flapping, even a, you can get the butterfly to follow a path. It's free. It's on my Gumroad. So you can just search for 10 animated butterflies. Oh, well, here's the link to the product. But I, I think I didn't, I actually provided the links to everything that I've mentioned uh, in this video. But here we go. So I just loaded in the FBX and positioned it by my character on her shoulder all right so let's talk about the other character in the scene or this animal over here which is a giraffe now i modified this giraffe i wanted it to be like an albino giraffe or some super rare species that you'd never encounter so it makes this entire you know encounter with this this person by god's window just a little bit more special so you can see this is an animated giraffe this is an asset that i got from cg trader this person created it. I don't even know how to <laughs> how to say your name, Janichis. But anyway, this is an animated giraffe. It is a blender file, but it's got a whole lot of different animations on it, which is really cool. But I did have to modify this. I had to remove sections of the tail and bring it into Blender. But from Blender, I saved it out as an Alembic file, and I basically brought that over to Cinema 4D. And then with the giraffe in Cinema 4D, you can see I added some additional detail on here, which I will cover. All of these strands over here is the hair system in Cinema 4D. So I had to do some hair grooming as well, just to add some more detail to the giraffe. And then uh, since this is an Alembic file, if I go to the giraffe here, with an Alembic file, I can actually offset this so I can choose where I want the animation to start. In this case, the giraffe is going to remain in place until it reaches 100 frames and then it will start moving. But this is the best part about this is that you can control the speed. So if I go back to my animation, you'll notice that the giraffe in the background is walking quite slow. But this giraffe in the foreground is moving a lot faster. So this one's speed is on 60 and the giraffe in the back is on 40. So this using the Olympic file is a fantastic way to offset, you know, the speed of animation. So if you've got animals or anything that's moving where there's a crowd, you can just offset the speed. Uh, just with that simple value. So that's exactly how I did that. All right, so there's also some birds in this animation. You'll see them flying across the sky right over there. So the birds are from Sketchfab, right? It's created by this person, Zaxophone. Uh, they've made this so you can download it for free. It's free to use. And it's just these birds that are flapping their wings. So they are in place. The only difference is in Cinema 4D, uh, when I brought them into the scene. Right, let me just go back to zero. Uh, go to the birds. So here's our birds over here. I literally just created some keyframes. So this would be on frame zero. And then I would literally just move them forward and create another frame. And then they're flapping their wings and it looks like they're flying across the sky. All right, so I'm going to go back to the giraffe and you'll notice on the giraffe itself that you can see I've added some additional hair on here onto the mane and onto the tail as well. And even on, it's, it's really subtle, you don't even really take notice of it, but there's some hair on the giraffe's horns as well. So I just want to show you how I did that directly in Cinema 4D. So if I go to my giraffe over here, you'll see it's got all of these hair guides. I'm actually going to delete all of them and show you how I did this from scratch. So I'll go to my poly. Now this giraffe has some selections on it. So I'll just double click over here to select this main region. Then go to simulate hair objects, add hair. So now it's going to add hair on here that's extremely long. So I want to select that, go to my editor, sorry, my hairs, put that on 500 and on guides, I'm going to reduce the length to 50 and click on enter. So there we go. 
So right now this hair is actually dynamic. Because if I go to zero and we click on play, the hair will actually fall down and it will also be affected by gravity and the giraffe's movement. So that's a nice way to create dynamic hair. But in this case, I didn't want this to be dynamic. I just wanted static hair. So I went to dynamics and I turned it off. Then I went to simulate hair tools and I just used the brush. So I literally just brushed this this way like this. So picking it up and bringing it over the giraffe's head. Now if some of the hairs, you know, go underneath the giraffe, obviously I can just hide the giraffe to access some of those hairs. So it's literally just combing this and brushing it over. That's all I was doing. So you can just see how this looks already in the preview over here with what I've been doing with all of these hairs. Now you want to control the way the hair looks by actually going to the hair material that's generated, which is over here. Now I always add a little bit of frizz. So I'll go to frizz and maybe bring this down to, let's maybe say two. A little bit of frizz and a little bit of kink. So kink I'll put on four as well. Well, maybe not that low, maybe on 10. This just adds a little bit more, you know, randomness to the hair. And that was basically it. Then it's just a matter of, you know, grooming this until it looks a certain way that you are happy with. And I think I just selected this and I changed the color to something lighter so that it matched closer to, you know, the color of the actual giraffe. Uh, but yeah, you can do some cool stuff just with the built-in hair tools. And just by using this grooming brush, you can see it's very, very cool stuff uh, that you can do. And these are just native tools that are built directly in Cinema 4D. So there we go. I just created a new main for our giraffe. And if you wanted to, you can even go to simulate hair tools and cut. So you can even make the hair shorter. Right? if you feel like it's too wild, you can cut that. So just play around, right? That's how you also learn is to experiment and play around. Play around with some of these tools. You can see you can add some curl on here as well. And yeah, it's awesome that this is built directly in Cinema 4D. So the last thing to cover is going to be the camera settings. So over here you can see I've got this free camera uh, that I just set up, uh, which is an Octane camera. And my focal length is, this is actually supposed to be at 50, but I did put that on 51 for some reason. <laughs> I don't think that makes much of a difference. It's only like one extra millimeter. Anyway, it's on 51. And then on the actual Octane settings over here, uh, you can see I am using some thin lens with autofocus. Just uh, increase the aperture so that the background is a little bit more blurred out. And then I'm using some motion blur as well on 0 0.02. So anything that's moving in my scene has this tag on it. Now you can right click and create this octane object tag. And with the, opti the octane object tag on motion blur, I've put it on transform vertex. So this just adds a little bit of motion blur to anything that's moving within the scene. And then I'm on my camera image, I'm using a linear response. You can see I've played around with some of the, the exposure and the gamma over here. And I also increased my vignette. So to create this dark uh, vignette region, just to create even more focus on what's outside of this grass tunnel. All right, and play around a little bit with the saturation. There's some post processing as well with some bloom. I always add bloom. It just adds a really nice shine or glowing effect to your renders. And then in the settings over here, I'm using path tracing and I brought my GI clamp immediately down to one. So this helps with getting rid of fireflies in your scene. And you can also combat fireflies uh, with your camera imager by reducing this hot pixel remover. So this does a fantastic job of getting rid of fireflies. And I also put my highlight compression on one because this helps get rid of any blown out highlights. So that's all of the camera settings. And yep, that is how the scene is being framed. All right, so I'm in Premiere Pro. Now I didn't do any uh, advanced editing to this clip. I literally just doubled it up to make the, the animation longer. And because it loops, uh, I could have literally stopped it right over there, but I wanted the music to play a little bit longer as well. That's why I doubled this up. So in terms of audio design, I've got this copyright free song on here that is created by Kenneth Sound. So it's called Beautiful Life Inspirational Cinematic Background Music. It's this piano solo that you hear. But, but if you listen closely, you can hear dry grass being stepped on by the giraffe as well. So I just found 
or audio of someone walking on dry grass and I time those footsteps with every footstep with the giraffe but you can see it's the volume starts off lower and as the giraffe passes right in front of the character it's at its highest volume then as it starts walking away the volume starts decreasing so just an additional layer of audio on top of all of this and then I also found some audio on YouTube of some background nature sounds so you can hear there's a flowing stream of water as well and some wind that's blowing and bringing all of those elements together creates some really nice uh, audio design uh, which creates this very peaceful and calming animation that you can that is both a auditory and visual experience so you see the beautiful visuals and you hear the beautiful audio as well bringing that all together i think creates a really nice animation so that is going to be the end of this breakdown video now hopefully you've learned a lot of useful tips and tricks from this maybe you've discovered new plugins uh, you've seen some of the resources I'm using as well and the assets that I use to put this entire scene together. It was so much fun to create. I just love building these fictional worlds. So this is Algon Valley in South Africa and there, there actually is a real Algon Valley uh, in South Africa as well that I have visited and what stood out the most to me was the beautiful scenery. So you won't see any albino giraffes walking around but the scenery captivated me and I wanted to, you know, basically pay tribute to what I witnessed in reality and do something like this, which I consider to be quite special and magical uh, with this beautiful giraffe that passes in front of them. And it's quite a relaxing piece to watch as well. It's just an endless loop. And yeah, that is it. Let me know what you think about the animation and all of these techniques. I hope you learned something useful from this. And as always, thank you so much for the support on this channel. You are super awesome. Stay tuned for some more videos and tutorials and goodbye. Mm -hmm.